Welcome everybody to our Tim at 10 today is, uh, what is today? Tuesday, uh, September 14th, uh, 2021. Um, I hope all of you are doing well and that you are safe in the area of the state that you are in. Um, just waiting here for some people to pop on, make sure we've got a good internet connection. We do have some weather going on in the area, like many of you in the state. So hopefully we'll have a good broadcast here and won't have any internet um, interruptions. Good morning, good morning. Uh, so once again, as everyone is joining us, um, we, like I said, we do have some weather happening in the state. I wish everyone well and I hope that you're all safe um, from uh, the, the tropical storm that's coming in. Um, we're going to do the best we can with the internet we've got right now. So if we do have any technical issues this morning, just breathe and be patient and we will get through it. Uh, we are here this morning to talk about basic care requirements for pre-kindergarten age uh, children and the caregivers that work with them. If this is your first time joining us, um, then uh, you can interact with me through the chat screen here on Facebook Live. Um, that makes it an instructor-led course with child care licensing. So 20% of your training hours uh, are instructor-led. Um, now, if you're watching the recorded video, all of, our, all of our webinars are recorded and you can watch them after the fact. Um, if you're watching this as a recording, um, then it would be self-instructional training, which is 80% of your training hours. Um, but right now we are live and so um, I see everyone popping on. At the end of the workshop today, I will post a link for a worksheet um, that you can complete if you are needing a certificate of completion. Um, there's a $5 fee for your certificate of completion. You'll fill out that worksheet at the end of the workshop today and easy breezy. Most of you have been doing this with me for a year and a half now. Uh, so we kind of know the routine. We know what we're supposed to be doing. So um, easy breezy. All right, and we're gonna go through the child care minimum standards uh, sub chapter J, uh, which is the basic care requirements for pre-kindergarten pre age children. And then we're also going to go through discipline and guidance and make that age appropriate for pre-kindergarten children. Now, uh, to begin, let's go ahead and define what is a pre-kindergarten age child according to child care regulations. That would be your three, four, and five-year-olds that have not yet started public school. So um, you may call it a three-year-old classroom. Licensing refers to them as pre-kindergarten children, all right? So um, we're gonna be talking about three, fours, and five-year-olds that have not started pu uh, public school yet, just to get that definition out there for you. Now, what are the basic care requirements for pre-kindergarten age children? Um, this is a lot uh, uh, more simple than the infants and toddlers that we've talked about in previous webinars. Um, basically, caregivers must provide pre-kindergarten age children individual attention and encourage children to communicate and to express feelings in an appropriate way. And I love that that is the one and only basic care requirement um, that is listed with the minimum standards is encourage children to communicate and express their feelings. All right. Um, and we talk about this in so many of our workshops that we want children to express and talk about their feelings. That is so very important, all right? Um, and even behind me, um, over here, actually, you can see my feeling buddies, all right? Which is a conscious discipline structure um, that we want to encourage children to express their feelings in a healthy and appropriate way. Feelings are okay, and we all have feelings, all right? Um, and for children to communicate, all right? Now, when we talk about encouraging children to communicate, remember all behavior is a form of communication. So when you have a child that is acting out in a classroom or when you have a child that is not meeting an expectation, um, whatever behavior that, that they're, uh, they're expressing, that is a form of communication, all right? So you always need to ask yourself, whatever this behavior is, um, you know, what is the child trying to communicate, all right? 
They don't have the language skills. They don't have the words to express their feelings, to express their emotions. Um, they, may, they may not be able to get this feeling um, out, all right? So it comes out as a behavior. That is a form of communication. We have to be there to help them push through those difficult feelings, all right? And, and push through those feelings, not stuff them down, not put them away, all right? Not dismiss them, but we have to help children push through those difficult and hard feelings right there, all right? And you can go to my uh, webinar on positive guidance and discipline, and we talk about that quite a bit in that particular webinar, all right? Um, and if, by the way, if you hear something today that you like, or you hear something that is an aha moment, you're like, oh wow, that's, that's, that's good information. I'm gonna practice that in my classroom. Be sure to give me a, a thumbs up or a heart um, or um, any little emoji that you wanna throw out there on Facebook. That would be greatly appreciated so that I can see that some of this information is kinda of getting through to you. So uh, the smiley face or whatever it is that, that you see right there available. So. Um, you know, like I said, that is um, appreciated whenever you do those different little uh, uh, emojis, like this little smiley face right there. So throw that out there. All right. Um, well, let's talk about uh, physical space requirements that you must provide your pre-kindergarten age children. All right. So uh, with physical space requirements for pre-kindergarten age children, um, there are two things listed right here, space and furnishing for activities without limited, uh, limiting children's movement, all right? So you need to have enough space that they can work comfortably, but also have enough space that it doesn't limit their movement. And remember, we've got new requirements on physical activities, uh, moderate to vigorous physical activities, we need to have enough room in that classroom that you can still have active play when weather doesn't permit, or you have a space in your building that you can go to, um, you know, whenever you need to do that physical activity um, and you can't go outside. And we'll talk about more of that in just a little bit. Um, and then space uh, in which children are allowed to find or create individual activities, but still permit the caregiver to easily supervise. Um, so once again, you need to make sure that your classroom room arrangement is done in a way that, um, that, that children can do individual activities because they're very independent at this age. They want to work alone in, in a lot of situations, but you have to be able to still adequately supervise them. So room arrangement is, in, is very, very important right here and you don't want blind spots, all right? So as a caregiver, before children come into your classroom, you need to really get familiar with that classroom and the arrangement of the furniture. Where are your blind spots? Where are there spots in the classroom that you're not gonna be able to adequately supervise the children? And it may be that you need to rearrange your classroom, all right? Now, um, avoid large open areas of the classroom because when you have large open areas, um, that's going to promote running and probably some rough and tumble play, all right? That can, that can take place outside right there. So, um, and I love classroom room arrangement. It's one of my favorite things to do is, is to go in and do classroom um, arrangements, but making sure that that adequate supervision there is really important. And remember that supervision is defined as sight, sound, awareness, positioning, and proximity. So depending on the child that you're working with and their developmental skills, which of those five uh, characteristics of supervision is going to be most important? Being able to see them, being able to hear them, being aware of what they're capable of, um, where you position yourself in the class or where you the proximity and where you position yourself in the classroom and and how easily can you get to them all right so positioning and proximity is important to keep in mind all right whenever you're working with these kids right here and we're going to talk about learning centers um, in, in this uh, webinar as well all right 
So physical space requirements, you're gonna see this again on your worksheet later on. So once again, space uh, for furnishing and activities without limiting the children's movement. So we need to have enough space for them to move around. And then space for children to uh, find uh, creative individual activities or to create individual activities, um, but then maintain adequate supervision, all right? Um, also, when it talks about furnishing and equipment that you must provide for pre-kindergarten age children, um, furnishings and equipment uh, for pre-K children must include the following. And there are seven interest centers um, that are listed here in the child care minimum standards. Um, now, you may have more than seven interest centers, um, but there are seven that are listed. And you might want to write these down because, once again, they're going to show up on your worksheet. So interest centers such as dramatic play, block building, stories and books, science and nature activities, art and music, sensory and problem solving activities. All right. And let's kind of really quickly talk about each one of those. Dramatic play is, in my opinion, one of the most important learning centers that you can have in your classroom. Uh, you can learn a lot about the children's uh, temperament, the children's characteristics, um, but the factors that are going on in their life that may be creating behavior or learning difficulties. Um, and dramatic play is one area where you can really do some good observations and assessments and get a good feel for what's going on in that child's life. Remember, you have to reach them before you can teach them, all right? So you gotta kinda dig into that soul and kinda find out what's going on there. The thing about dramatic play is that children will typically act out domestic scenes, things that are going on in their life, but they are very, it's very common that not only will they act out, you know, events that are going on in their life, but you will actually see them act out their desired outcome. And that's important for you to watch out for right there. And remember, the three adults that they typically act out in dramatic play are mom, dad, and teacher. So um, pay close attention because they tend to mimic you quite a bit. So that's why we say so often in our workshops, you know, our outside voice becomes their inside voice. We're programming that inner speech. So, um, and because children have immature inner speech, they have no filter. So that's why they say whatever comes to their brain, all right? Um, but when they're acting like mom, dad, teacher, you actually learn a lot, all right? Um, block building is another interest center or learning center that is really important for, uh, for development. And when we talk about observation and assessment, once again, you learn a lot about what's going on in that child's life whenever they're working in the block center, all right? Um, and go to my uh, workshop, um, Power of Play. Um, it's one of my all-time favorite topics to, um, to speak on. And I've got a webinar called Power of Play that is really, really awesome. Y'all need to check it out if you haven't watched it yet. Um, but again, we go through each of these interest centers in detail and we talk about everything that the child is learning, all of the cognitive skills and executive functions that are being developed as they play in e each of these interest centers. So check that out right there. Stories and books that are age appropriate for the children, mix them up. Don't throw all of your books out there at one time. Rotate them through, all right? That's also gonna help take better care of them right there. Um, but again, when you pick up on factors that are going on in that child's life, you can put children's books in your classroom that meet the needs of the children, meet the needs of their social and emotional situation. So um, that's why you don't throw all of your books out at one time. You're gonna throw stories and books out that are meaningful to the children and what's going on in their social and emotional world, okay? Science and nature activities. Um, I've been talking about this a whole lot here recently for some reason. Um, I think it's one of the most underused interest centers um, and, and probably needs to be one of the most used interest centers. Um, but science and nature is going to create curiosity. It's going to encourage exploration. 
and all of these are executive executive functions all right so we want more curiosity we want more exploration and science and nature being attuned to the world around them understanding the world around them is going to be a great way to get that so i challenge all of you watching this to enhance your science and nature centers all right that's some good stuff right there art you know tap into that creative outlet once again that's an executive function um, tapping into that creative outlet relieves stress it relieves anxiety and frustration um, as an adult you need to tap into your creative outlet but for young children you know once again this is an important one right here I just did a training this past Saturday on um, introduction to STEM and understanding the engineering design process. And we actually talked a lot about the A in STEM and what the art part of STEM um, is for and why that A in STEM is so incredibly important. And it's not just painting and coloring and doing art projects. But when we talk about the arts, it's also singing and dancing, poetry, all right? Um, you know, really, really digging deep into that creative outlet right there. And of course, uh, sensory, we want to include sensory, especially for this age group. Um, you know, most of the children that we work with in our early education programs have signs and symptoms of a special need that has not been diagnosed yet. It is very, very common for us to work with children that have not been diagnosed yet. A lot of the special needs that we work with, such as autism, is not typically diagnosed until the child is a pre-kindergarten age child. So they're just now getting to this point where they may or may not be diagnosed. The sensory activities are gonna be really important for these kids, especially if they have sensory processing disorders, all right, which is very, very common for a lot of the children that we work with. So um, make sure that you um, have sensory activities out there. Um, and, and of course, right now it needs to be done healthy, so we want to avoid cross-contamination. And it might be that you have individual sensory activities for each child to avoid that cross-contamination, but that can easily be done. And in problem-solving activities that, in, that are clearly defined, that are organized for independent use by children, and arranged so that children's activities are visible to the caregiver, all right? So lots of good opportunities for problem-solving. Again, that's that cause and effect, that's that um, action and reaction, um, which are developing executive functions that are uh, so important for their, their de um, learning development. Um, so I challenge all of you to create opportunities for cause and effect, to create opportunities for action and reaction, those problem solving skills um, that these kids really need to work on at this age group. All right. Um, on age-appropriate seating, um, tables and nap equipment that are age-appropriate for this particular child. Um, make sure that you've got furniture and equipment that is comfortable for them to sit in. Enough of your popular items so that children are not forced to compete with them. Remember, even at age three and four, they are still learning how to cooperate, learning how to share. Um, they're still developing empathy, all right? Um, understanding the world around them and how their actions affect others. This is a skill that is still being practiced at this point in life, all right? So, you know, depending on the developmental um, age of the child, you may have a three or four year old that has some developmental delays. Um, having enough popular items for them is gonna help to avoid conflict in some situations. And then um, I think this one right here is really, really important for everyone to understand. And, um, but you have containers or low shelving available so that items, um, so that items children can safely use without direct supervision um, are, are accessible um, to the children. So the toys and the equipment and the manipulatives need to be accessible 
to the children. Not put away in a closet or up on a high shelf. They need to be on low shelves, sorted in buckets or trays, um, but however you want to do it in your program. But they are available to the children, all right? Um, you know, sometimes I go into classrooms to do observations and I see toys and equipment that are way up high, you know, or put away in a closet and I'm like, hey, where's all the stuff, you know? Um, where's the toys and the manipulatives? Oh, we put them away. And I'm like, why? Well, the kids just keep making a mess. Well, that's what they're supposed to do, all right? Um, they have to be accessible to the children. And, and part of picking up the, the toys is a skill that has to be practiced, all right? And, and cleaning up and putting away items is actually a learning opportunity, all right? But we have to teach the children how to clean up and practice that skill with them, all right? And putting things away, putting things on high shelves, um, putting things in closet is not going to teach or practice that skill, all right? So that's important right there. Practice, practice, practice. All right, when we talk about what activities uh, must we provide pre-kindergarten age children, um, daily activities for pre-kindergarten age children must include the following. Opportunities for outdoor play, weather permitting, um, as outlined in the child care minimum standards. So once again, this age group needs to have 60 minutes of outdoor play if you're a full-time program. Um, so 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the afternoon um, when weather permits. All right. Opportunities for thinking skills and sensory development. So some examples of age appropriate equipment or activities would include sand and water play, blocks, framed puzzles with up to 30 pieces. 30 pieces is what is appropriate for this age group. And a variety of stringing beads, all right? Um, and simple board games that are age appropriate for three to four year olds. Um, that would be thinking skills and sensory development. All right. Oh, uh, I was reading a comment. So many parents cannot believe that their children will clean up a learning center because they don't clean up at home. All right. Um, you know, well, again, mom and dad, that is a skill that has to be practiced. Uh, but if we continue to, to do it for them, they're never, never going to be able to master that skill. All right. Um, and probably master that skill is not the right wording right there because even as adults, we haven't mastered this skill of clean up. We have to continue to practice it. Um, but, but yes, um, we just routines and structure and predictability are going to help. And this is a great opportunity to help mom and dad um, by kind of showing them some, some good routines. You know, take a picture of a learning center when it is clean and organized and everything is in its place and take a picture of it and say, this is what the math center should look like. And then, um, you know, have a picture of a messy after the kids play with it. Um, this is a, a picture of the math. This is what the math center should not look like. And then below that, here are the steps to cleaning up the math center. You know, and have some visuals. First, the child pulls the bucket out of the math center. So a picture of the child pulling a bucket out. A picture of a child putting, uh, you know, the, the counting bears into the bucket. A picture of the child putting the bucket full of counting bears back into the math center. But have these visual steps to show them, you know, how to clean up the math center. And then we're going to practice. So we're going to model, add visuals, and practice, all right? So always have those visuals available, all right? Um, and like I said, and so many times when I go into classrooms, I see shelves labeled with the items that are supposed to go on the shelf, and that is very helpful, but don't forget the steps, all right? Um, they have to have step one. We're going to pull the bucket out. Step two, we're going to put the bears in the bucket. Step three, we're going to put the bucket back in there. Just having a picture of a clean center is not going to show them the steps. So that's important right there. 
opportunities for small muscle development. So uh, some age appropriate equipment or activities would include large non-toxic crayons, markers, paint, watercolors, or various size brushes with adjustable easels, collage materials, chalkboard and chalk, clay or dough and tools, a workbench with accessories, round end scissors that are age appropriate for the children, glue and paste, different types of music and videos, rhythm instruments, and finger plays. All right. And what I really like to do with the basic care requirements um, for each of the different age groups, especially when we talk about what activities must I provide for the children, use this as a checklist to make sure that you have all of the items needed in that particular classroom. So if you're developing a list of all of the different toys and equipment and supplies that you need for each classroom, here it is. It's right here in the child care minimum standards under what activities must I provide um, for each of the different age groups. Um, I like to do this, we'll have a staff meeting sometimes, and I like to do this during my CDA class back when I used to teach CDA live um, and in person. Um, but we would go on a scavenger hunt and I would give them a copy of this page in the minimum standards and have people go into their classroom and find all of these items. And it really kind of helps teach the, uh, the caregiver that there is a reason, there is a purpose for all of this equipment that's in there. Um, the next thing is opportunities for large muscle development. So some age appropriate equipment or activities would include uh, small wagons for them to pull, lightweight balls of all sizes, uh, small wheelbarrows that they can push, tricycles that are age appropriate, um, pushing toys, swings, slides, climbing equipment, balance beams that are safe for the children, um, hanging bars and outdoor building materials. And most of your large muscle um, development is going to occur outside, all right? Opportunities for moderate to vigorous active play, both indoors and outdoors, as specified in the child care minimum standards. So some examples of age appropriate equipment or activities would include active games such as tag or hot potato. Y'all remember those as a kid? Um, dancing and creative mu uh, movement to music and singing. Um, I think that everybody loves to dance. I just think that some people don't like being watched uh, dancing, all right? But everyone loves to sing and dance, just some of us don't like to be watched or heard. Um, we got to, you know, step out of our comfort zone on that one right there. The kids don't care. All right, this is not, you know, American preschool idol. They're not going to care. All right, simple games and dramatic or imaginary play that encourage running, stretching, climbing, walking, and marching. Um, I'm so happy about the new rules on moderate to vigorous active play. I think not only the children need it, but the adults need it. Now, for this particular age group, you need 90 minutes of moderate to vigorous active play each day, all right, if you're a full-time program. Um, so, you know, 60 minutes can be done outside, so whenever you're doing your outside time, so that means you need to have 30 additional minutes of moderate to vigorous activities inside the classroom, if you're counting that 60 minutes of outside time. All right, so maybe 15 minutes of yoga or Pilates in the morning, uh, 15 minutes of dancing and singing in the afternoon. The whole thing, what I've been telling people about the physical activity requirements, most of us were already meeting this. It just wasn't, you know, structured or standardized. And so now we just need to make sure that it's on your activity plans or it's in your daily schedule. But most of you were already doing this. Um, opportunities for language development. So examples of age appropriate equi equipment would be flannel boards, uh, stories, puppets, a variety of storybooks, writing materials, uh, and stories on, on tape or video. All right. Now remember, screen time is limited to one hour a day. 
all right so if you are using a tablet or a screen a computer or a tv uh, for some of these activities that is limited to one hour a day all right um, but you can use that for your language development even though the tvs and the videos and the screens are helpful the children are going to learn best through your modeling all right your outside voice all right not what's on that recording that's what they're going to learn the best from and then opportunities for social and emotional development uh, so some age appropriate equipment or activities here would be dress up clothing and accessories mirrors dolls simple props uh, for different themes puppets transportation toys play animals table games, um, those type of things. But we want to encourage, um, you know, those pro-social behaviors and pro-social development um, and give the children the tools they need to express themselves emotionally, all right? Um, so, you know, you gotta remember that some of the items in your classroom, they're not toys, they're tools. And tools are to help us build and learn all right, so active breathing tools, all right, um, tools to help children express their emotions. All of these are going to be very helpful for you. And then last one, opportunity to develop self-help skills, um, such as toileting and hand washing, um, you know, returning equipment to storage areas and containers, uh, um, serving and self-serving their food, so family-style meal service, um, if you're doing that. Um, you know, these are all skills that need to be practiced to help children with their self-help skills. And, you know, even at three and four, going to the restroom independently, washing their hands independently, these are all skills that have to be practiced by the children. All right. So let's keep that in mind. All right. Let's talk a little bit about um, discipline and guidance all right, for pre-kindergarten age children. Um, when we talk about what methods of discipline and guidance can a caregiver use, and this is subchapter L in the child care minimum standards, um, but first off, I want you to really reflect on the difference between punishment and discipline, all right? Punishment is normally meant to hurt or shame, where discipline comes from the word disciple, and discipline is to teach, all right? So there's a big difference between punishment and discipline, all right? Discipline and guidance. Punishing a behavior does not teach a new skill. The only way you can replace a troublesome behavior is to teach a new skill. All right, um, so always keep that in mind whenever you're working with your kids. And like I said earlier in the webinar, all behavior is a form of communication. So when you have a child that's acting out in the classroom, when you have a child that's being aggressive, always ask yourself, all right, what is the child trying to communicate? And then what skill is missing? So what skill do we need to lend to this child? What skill do we need to practice so that they can meet the expectation? Now, discipline needs to be individualized and consistent for each child, and that's important right there, that it's consistent, all right? The more consistency we have in the classroom, the more skills we are practicing. That goes back to predictability. And do you have predictability in your classroom? All right. Um, is the discipline appropriate for the child's level of understanding? All right. So do they understand the process here? Do they understand the skill that you're trying to teach and the purpose behind it? And remember, when a child is upset, all right, when the child is in the lower parts of their brain, no learning can take place. So you're going to practice a lot of these skills when the child is in the higher centers of their brain. All right, when they're in their executive state, that's when you practice. 
When a child is upset, when a child is aggressive, no learning can take place at that point in time. All right. So when we talk about is the discipline appropriate for the child's level of understanding, you've got to look at their emotional state at that time. All right. Um, and it might be that whatever their emotional state is or their survival state, our job at that point is to just keep them safe and let them know that we are there to keep them safe. All right. And then once they calm, all right, then we can practice new skills. But no learning can take place whenever they're in upset. Always keep that in mind. Is the discipline directed towards teaching the child acceptable behaviors and self-control? All right. And then, um, so, so focus on that. All right. Focus on that right there. And we got to practice these skills once again. Um, Y'all might, I'm just, I feel like I'm just repeating myself over and over again, but we've got to practice these skills. A positive method of discipline and guidance that encourage self-esteem, self-control, and self-direction. So we need to practice that self-regulation and give them the, t the tools needed to self-regulate. So using praise and encouragement. Uh, for the good beha behavior instead of focusing only on the unacceptable behavior. You know, this is the power of positive intent. What we focus on, we get more of. So if we focus on the desired behavior, we focus on the positive behavior, that's what we'll get more of. But if we only focus on the unacceptable behavior, you're going to continue to get unacceptable behavior. So power of positive intent. What we focus on, we get more of. Remind the child of, their, of the expectations daily by using clear, positive statements. Um, visuals, I know I've already talked about visuals, but lots and lots of real life pictures showing the child the expectation. All right? And then throughout the day, you're going to be constantly reminding them and then telling them when they've done something correctly. You pushed in the chair just like this so that the other children would be safe. That was helpful. All right. So describe, notice, and acknowledge when they've done something helpful. All right. Um, and again, what you focus on, you get more of. For this particular age group, three and four year olds, y'all, this is so important. I just can't tell you how important this is, all right? The describe, the notice, and the acknowledge um, of, the, the, of the desired behavior, the acceptable behavior, um, instead of always focusing on the negative. Redirect behavior using positive statements, all right? Um, you wanted to go outside. It's hard, isn't it? I know it's hard when you want to go outside, but it's not quite time yet. I understand. All right. Let's go play in the block center. Um, and, and there we can build roads and towers until it's time to go outside. All right. Or you can go to the art center and paint with feathers. Which one works best for you? Um, but acknowledge the fact that, that it's hard to wait. Um, they're ready to go outside right now. Um, so, you know, but let's give them some redirection. Um, on what they can do. Focus on what children can do instead of what they can't do. Um, I'm not a believer in timeout. Um, I, I, uh, putting a child in timeout does not teach a new skill. Um, it is not reasonable. It is not related. It is not respectful um, to whatever the behavior is that the child exhibited. Um, but if you do use timeout or a brief separation, um, from the group, then it needs to be appropriate for the child's age and development, which is typically limited to no more than one minute per the child's age. So if they're a three-year-old, three minutes. Four-year-old, four minutes. All right? If that's what you choose to do. Um, now, once again, in my opinion, timeout does not teach a new skill. And so we're not going to replace that troublesome behavior um, by simply putting them in timeout because uh, there's nothing being taught there. All right. 
Now, just keep in mind that there are types of discipline and guidance or punishment that are prohibited in our classrooms. So um, here are things that you cannot do in your classroom. Now, what you do at home with your own child, that's up to your beliefs and convictions, as long as that child is not being abused. In our licensed programs, different story. All right, so no corporal punishment or threats of corporal punishment. All right, and saying, if you don't stop it, I'm going to call your mother and you know what's going to happen then. That is a threat. All right, so be very careful with those words right there. No punishment associated with food, naps, or toilet training. All right, all right, everyone. Everyone that behaves today is going to get a piece of candy. Do you all want a piece of candy? All right, so the ones that don't meet the expectations, no candy for you. God, that's prohibited. All right, number one, you don't need to be giving them candy. But number two, that is punishment associated with food. All right. Uh, hopefully, you're not going to say something like, if you don't behave, I'm going to throw your lunch away. Um, that's definitely prohibited. Where I typically see this deficiency is, uh, you know, trying to uh, motivate the children with a treat at the end of the day, and that treat happens to be a food item, all right? Um, that would be a deficiency right there. Pinching, shaking, or biting a child is prohibited. So once again, your composure is very important, and you being able to maintain control, uh, you being able to self-regulate is, is huge, all right, especially for this age group, all right? Um, now, I talked about this a lot with my toddler two-year-old um, basic care requirements because that is a tough age group, a little bit easier here. However, with this particular age group, you're seeing a lot more temperament, a lot more temperament. So remember, self-regulation is always an adult first, child second model. An adult first, child second model. So the adult has to be regulated before a child can be regulated, all right? When we stay regulated, we hopefully uh, will not pinch, shake, or bite a child, hit a child on a hand with an instrument, uh, put anything in a child's mouth, humiliate, ridicule, reject, or yell at a child, all right? Um, or subject a child to harsh, abusive, or profane language. So that self-composure is going to help you uh, avoid these prohibited um, items right here, all right? And so a lot of these self-regulation tools and reminders, the visuals that we put in our classroom to breathe, the reminder to breathe, um, you know, to see the best in others, um, a lot of these uh, visuals are more for the adult than it is for the child because we have to be constantly reminded to breathe and to tell ourselves stop take a deep breath and relax all right you are safe you can handle this you can help this child with their problem all right but we have to regulate ourselves first and then we can help the child all right um, and obviously a prohibited behavior, no placing a child in a locked or dark room, bathroom, or closet. Um, that's going to not only get you fired, but put you in jail. So don't be doing that, okay? And then one of the new items that we have in the child care minimum standards that I want to make sure y'all are aware of, because for pre-kindergarten age children, I see this all the time, all right? Um, you cannot withhold active play or keep a child inside as a consequence for behavior, all right? So you cannot withhold active play or outside time as a form of punishment. Um, and the children that are being impulsive, the children that are being aggressive, y'all, they need that active play. They need to get outside and run, all right? That's going to be the best thing for them, um, especially the boys that are out there. Withholding active play or telling a child that they can't go outside 
is like getting a soda bottle and putting your fingering over the top and shaking it up and shaking it up and shaking it up and then that kid is about to just you know explode and then whenever you tell them no active play no outside time it's like the pressure getting so um, so so much pressure in that coke bottle that your finger can no longer hold it and that's when it's gonna blow up alright so um, letting them have their active play letting them go outside you're gonna stop shaking a soda bottle alright so don't do that right there and of course remaining a child to remain silent or inactive for an inappropriate long period of time um, that is also prohibited right there um, or placing a child in a restrictive device. Now, I typically don't see this in a three or four year old classroom, toddlers and twos, because that's when we're dealing with the primitive behavior of biting. Um, I will see them put in a high chair or something to keep them from biting other children. That would be prohibited. You can't put a child in a restrictive device as a form of punishment. Um, but for three and four year olds, I don't typically see this type of behavior out of a caregiver. Could happen, no. All right. Just know putting a child in a restrictive device, that is prohibited right there. All right. So um, a little bit shorter uh, material than infant, um, infants and toddlers, um, but those are your basic care requirements for pre-kindergarten age children. Um, I, refer, I would like to refer you to not only the power of play, that video that I did on the power of play, that's gonna be very helpful for this particular age group. Also, I have a webinar on understanding cognitive development. Um, definitely recommend you check out that webinar. It's gonna go a lot deeper into those executive functions and cognitive skills that um, this particular age group is, is they're like sponges um, at this point and they're just soaking it all up. And then also my webinar on engagement techniques um, is going to be really really helpful for those of you working with three and four year olds all right so i wanted to uh, recommend those three particular uh, videos that can be found on my website timthetrainer.com um, if you haven't watched them recently um, i think they would be definitely helpful for this particular age group all right uh, fantastic well um, that's all I've got to, uh, to talk about with basic care requirements for pre-kindergarten age children. Um, the worksheet, the link to complete your worksheet should be on Facebook now. Um, so if you refresh your browser or you go to the top of the Facebook page, um, if you're going to pay with a credit card, you're going to click on uh, worksheet paying with a credit card. Um, if you have established an online account with me and you have a five digit account number, then you'll click on um, online worksheet paying with an account number. Uh, so those are your two options. Um, I will also post these links in the chat, uh, the comment section here as soon as we're done recording. Um, if you came in late, and you missed the first part of this uh, webinar, please go back and watch the beginning uh, before you complete your online worksheet. Um, if you're doing the recording, then obviously you need to make sure you're watching all of the recording from start to finish before you do your worksheet. That's very, very important. All right. All right. I wish all of you well. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Um, we will not have any more Tim at 10s this week. Um, I'm actually going out of town um, um, towards the end of the week, so I had to rearrange my schedule for a last minute trip. Um, and then I will have my October 10 at 10s um, posted, hopefully sometime today is my plan. All right, so there you go. Um, Deborah, if you want to give me a call or shoot me an email, I'll be happy to talk to you about your issue personally um, instead of right here on Facebook, but I would encourage you to check your spam or junk folder. Otherwise, call us or shoot us an email and we can tell you where those were emailed to. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. And those of you that are in um, the coastal areas of the state, stay safe, stay well, hang in there. You got this, okay? Um, and um, as always, continue to practice um, healthy habits and, um, and push through. Don't give up. All right. We'll see all of you very, very soon. Thank you.